The Battle of Luz, the Great Push of September 1915, has become the forgotten battle in an overlooked year of the war, overshadowed by the battles of the Somme and Passchendaele. Yet Luz was not simply the largest battle of the war to date, it was also the bloodiest. The loss of life on the first day was proportionately worse than that of the infamous first day of the Somme. There was the ear-shattering percussion of the initial barrage, the mental agony of waiting for the whistle to blow at zero hour, the nerve-wracking experience of going over the top, advancing across open ground in the face of enemy machine gun fire, and confusion, compounded by the gas, which drifted forward and then back across the battlefield. Thus, the Battle of Luz would be the testing ground for Kitchener's recently recruited new armies and the largely untested territorials. One of these, the 18th Battalion of the London Regiment, better known as the London Irish Rifles, had a key role to play in the initial attack. And in the ranks of the London Irish Rifles was Patrick McGill, better known at the time as the Navy Poet, who was to chronicle the battle. In the scene of action, a chapter dealing with our night prior to the Great Push was written in the trench between midnight and dawn of September the 25th. The concluding chapter in the hospital of Versailles, two days after I had been wounded at Luce. As he waited in the early hours before going over the top, he reflected on the prospect of the forthcoming battle, and particularly on the inevitable slaughter. My normal self revolted at the thought of the coming dawn. The experience of life had not prepared me for one day of savage and ruthless butchery. Tomorrow I had to go forth, prepared to do much that I disliked. He reflected also on the men in the trenches opposite him. Who are these men behind the line of sandbags that I should want to kill them? To disembowel them with my sword? blow their faces to pieces at 300 yards, bomb them into eternity. I'm not angry with them. I know little of their race. They are an utter strangers to me. The enormity of killing and being killed loomed at large. At dawn I might deprive him of his life and he might deprive me of mine. To kill a man, to feel for ever after the deed that you have deprived a fellow being of life. So too did the fear of fear itself. On the writ loose salient, in the knowledge of the forthcoming battle, he wrote a lament. I wish that I were back again in the glens of Donegal. They call me a coward if I return, and a hero if I fall. Is it better to be a living coward or thrice a hero dead? It's better to go to sleep, my lad. The colour sergeant said. His introspection was ended by the starting of the preliminary bombardment, the sinister and sullen voices of destruction, as he called them, and then the signal to advance. There on the open field of death, my life was out of my keeping, but the sensation of fear never entered my being. There was so much simplicity and so little effort in doing what I had done in doing what 800 comrades had done. The battlefield sights were shocking, even to the ex-navvy, now turned stretcher bearer. Men and pieces of men were lying all over the place. A leg, an arm, then again a leg, cut off at the hip, a finely formed leg, the latter gracefully puttied. Fifty yards further along I found the rest of him. Here I came across dead, dying and sorely wounded, lives maimed and finished, and all the romance and roving that makes up the life of a soldier gone forever. The sights that met the London Irish as they entered the village of Luce confirmed the destructiveness of modern warfare. Houses had been destroyed, the church severely damaged, the graveyard hit by shells, macabrely throwing long dead corpses into the air as the living desperately sought shelter underground. And then there were the recent dead and wounded. When we came to the places where the dead lay six deep, we had to crawl across them on our hands and knees. 
On either side we could hear the wounded making mourn. Their cries were like the yelping of drowning puppies. But the man who was with me seemed unconscious of his surroundings. Seldom even did he notice the dead on the floor of the trench. He walked over them unconsciously. The shock of the advance was soon overtaken by an awareness of its cost, the loss of comrades. The poignant poem, After Luth, was written on the 28th of September in the immediate aftermath of the battle and at the Café Pierre Le Blanc, where McGill and his friends had been drinking and talking the day before. Wasn't it only yesterday lusty comrades marched away? Neither covered up in clay. Seven glasses used to be for six good mates and me. Now we only call for three. Life and supple lads were they, marching merrily away. Was it only yesterday? And the sense of personal loss was exacerbated by survivor guilt, as can be seen in the naive but emotional poem, Matey. I'd sooner the bullet were mine, matey, going out on my own, leaving you here in the line, matey, all by yourself alone. Shut my mind, you're dead, matey, and this is the way we part. The bullet went through your head, matey. God, it went through my heart. And there were the psychological horrors McGill survived this ordeal and sought to explain how he and others had done so. After the battle, the wounded McGill was taken to hospital at Versailles, where he tried to come to terms with the physical and mental damage that he and his colleagues had suffered. His essentially working class masculinity was threatened by physical injuries. The every day of war written in November 1915, summed up his feelings. A hand is crippled and a leg is gone and fighting's passed for me. The empty hours crawl slowly on. How they flew where I used to be. But here I am kept to the narrow bed, a maimed and broken thing. Never a long day's march ahead where brown battalions swing. The ward fire burns in a cheery way a vision in every flame. There are books to read and games to play, but oh, for the old, old game. With glancing bayonet and trusty gun and wild blood bursting free. But a hand is crippled and a leg is gone and the game's no more for me. McGill's response was personal, shaped by his distinctive background as an Irish navvy and his specific experiences as a rifleman and later a stretcher bearer in the London Irish Rifles. But it has a wider significance, enabling later generations to understand both the brutality of modern mechanised warfare and, more importantly, how ordinary infantrymen coped with the unprecedented horrors of the Western Front. His account, in poetry and prose, combined both horror and heroism. But his admiration for the bravery of the soldier did not degenerate into uncritical, gung-ho heroism. His anguish at the cost of war did not degenerate into the cynical pessimism of, oh, what a lovely war, or Black Adder goes forth. He made no attempt to disguise the physical destruction of war, but he also emphasised its psychological pressures. In the short run, he came to terms with his twin demons, fear and killing others, but he returned time and again in the coming years to his wartime experiences, constructing new narratives as he remembered and re-remembered incidents from his time in France. The war was not a one-off set of experiences that could be safely left in the past. It was a life sentence, a dynamic, ongoing process of coming to terms with exceptional and traumatic events. That was the true horror of the Great War. <laughs>